What's really true about heaven? In this video, we cover 10 things that you should know about heaven. Number 1. Heaven is a true, tangible place. John 14. Heaven is an actual, physical location. Heaven is neither a metaphysical term nor a mental state. It is not a figment of someone's imagination, make-believe, or pretend. Heaven, like Miami, London, and Tokyo, is a true and physical place. In John 14, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. He wasn't going to prepare a state of mind. He wasn't going to prepare a concept. No, he was going to prepare an actual place specially created for those who have a personal relationship with God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. John 14, 2-4 First, notice how Jesus refers to his Father's house and how many rooms it contains. Second, Note how Jesus uses the word place three times in this short passage. In some languages, the word translated place has been translated as mansions. But the reference was to rooms added to the patriarch's house as sons married and brought their wives to live in the extended family compound or estate. Finally, Jesus promises that he will return to get us so that we can be with him. So, if Jesus is true and lives somewhere, we are promised to be with him in that place. Number two, God the Father is there and Jesus is on his right hand. The disciples were taught to begin their prayers by addressing our Father in heaven in Jesus' model prayer of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Romans 8, 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. According to Romans 8, after being crucified and resurrected, Jesus ascended back into heaven and is now interceding for us at the right hand of God. When Stephen was stoned in Acts 7, the Bible says he saw heaven opened up and Jesus standing at God's right side. Jesus is the only one who has ever been to heaven before being born on earth. As a result, when he speaks of heaven and eternity, he does so with authority and conviction. Number three, all the believers are there. Hebrews 12 talks about the church of the firstborn. This is a reference to Jesus' church, which is the firstborn of God. All the believers who put their confidence and trust in Jesus Christ make up the church of Jesus Christ. Following on from the report concerning the church of the firstborn, the author of Hebrews claims that all believers' names are written in heaven. Hebrews 12, 23 To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Number 4 there will be people in heaven from all nations. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders announce in this great scene around the throne in heaven that only Jesus is worthy to open the seals of the scroll that will disclose these end-time events. People from all nations have responded to the gospel and have a position in heaven because of Jesus' sinless sacrifice on the cross. This is a beautiful depiction of God's heart. Heaven will be multi-ethnic, with people from every culture, people community, and country gathered around God's throne. Number five, our names are recorded there. Luke 10, 20. 
In Luke 10, something really interesting happens. 72 of Jesus' followers were sent out in pairs into the surrounding towns and villages. They were tasked with healing the sick and spreading the gospel of Jesus. The Bible says that when the 72 returned, they were overjoyed and exclaimed. Luke 10, 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. All these were the precursor to an assignment trip debrief, and much to their surprise and joy, these early disciples of Jesus discovered that they had control and authority over demons as well. Jesus was swift to issue a warning. He remarked, However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 20. It's like Jesus was saying, as grand as it is that you have power over demons, don't ever forget that the grandest gift you've been given is that your name is written in heaven. Have you ever had the knowledge of going to a conference? You see, having your name written on the list denotes that you are a member of a group. It states that you have the right to participate and join. It states that you took the requisite measures to obtain a conference seat. It states that you meet the entry requirements. The same can be said in heaven. The fact that your name is written there indicates that you belong and have the authority to join and participate as someone who has placed their faith in Jesus. Number 6. We have an inheritance there. 1 Peter 1, 3-4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I want you to take a minute and try to imagine that your dad is a wealthy king, and then one day he comes in and tells you that he's leaving you his whole fortune. Now that is pretty fun to imagine. I'm willing to bet your heart would begin to beat a little faster, a grin would appear on your face, and you'd become giddy with anticipation about everything that was about to happen. The good news is that your heavenly Father has given you an everlasting inheritance, which is safely deposited in heaven. That isn't just a fluffy theological notion. What you will get in eternity far outweighs inheriting a billion dollars. Number 7. Our Citizenship is There Philippians 3.20 In Philippians 3.20, the Apostle Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. An old song says, This world is not our home, and that is absolutely true. According to the Bible, we are pilgrims and nomads traveling through this land known as Earth. That is one of the reasons why we should not be carried away with. Consider this. Our American ambassador to Japan may have a temporary residence there, but he is still a resident of the United States. It would be treasonous for him to give up his U.S. citizenship. It is moral treason for Christians to live and behave as the world. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we are ambassadors who are here to serve our king. However, we are people of a different kingdom. We are members of the heavenly kingdom. And as citizens of the heavenly kingdom, I am entitled to such rights and blessings simply for being a citizen. I know it's difficult to understand, but you have a spiritual passport that you got when you trusted Christ as your savior. And heaven is your home. God expects us to respond in kind. Number 8. Specific eternal rewards are given there. Did you know that your actions in this life have an effect on your eternal life? With these words from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus offered wise advice as well as a strong challenge. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19-21 Jesus reminds us that the things of this world are just temporary. It will eventually wear out, give out, break down, and be discarded. The new car you so desperately want will only last a few years. In less than a year, the new smartphone you've been eyeing will be obsolete. By next fall, the jacket you've been eyeing will be forgotten in the back of your wardrobe. The treasures we keep in heaven, on the other hand, are everlasting and will never decay, rust, or ruin. When you make financial investments, you are putting money away that will be there for you later in life. The same is true of your spirituality. When you make spiritual investments of time, talents, and treasure in God's kingdom and His purpose, you are making deposits in heaven that will be waiting for you when you arrive. Number 9. It's the best of earth, only better. Revelation 22. The world in which we live today is an old earth that has fallen. But there is a new heaven and a new earth that is as real, physical, and tangible as this earth, but it's going to be unbelievably better. It will not be damaged by sin and disease, as well as by pollution and disaster. The planet on which we live is a gift from God, but it is stained and scarred by sin. No scientific or environmental breakthrough will make this place a paradise. We must be meticulous stewards of the planet God has given us. But we shouldn't put our hope here. God is preparing for us a new heaven and a new earth that far exceeds our wildest imagination. Number 10. Sin, death, and sorrow are absent. Revelation 21, 4. Heaven will be great because a few things won't be there. In Revelation 21, 4, John says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There is no place you can go on this earth to escape the clutches of death. You see, the truth is that we are all terminal. The death rate in our community is 100%. None of us are exempt, and none of us will escape. Ecclesiastes 8.8 says, None of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. So the question is not so much if, but when. The Bible says that the Lord has numbered our days, but He has never revealed His spreadsheet. I don't know the number of my days, and you don't know the number of yours. But one thing we do know for sure is that death is coming. In stark contrast to earth, heaven will be very different. Sin and death and sorrow will be forever removed. Imagine a place where there are no cemeteries or funeral homes. Imagine a place where there are no rehab and recovery clinics. God is preparing that place for us right now. In closing, our question for the day, what worship songs move your heart closer to Jesus?